it gives me really great pleasure to welcome um, my colleague Eric Hayo to the stage. Um, and Eric is a professor of comparative literature and the director of the Center for Humanities and Information here at Penn State. This is a new research and um, research and sort of um, outreach institute that is has developed in the College of Liberal Arts in the past in the past three years. Eric's the person who conceived it, and it's already really developing great traction with things that might seem on the outside of your perspectives now, but really will be the sorts of topics about how the humanities and all of the new information technologies that we live with, and also older technologies, you know, for instance, books, the abacus, those sorts of things, uh, how those things interact in our new digital connected way. And I think that students 20 years from now will be learning from perspectives that um, Eric and his faculty and his guests are studying now. Um, Eric got his BA from Georgetown in 1993 and his doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 1999. He is the author of numerous books, including um, perhaps most prominently, if not most li recently, On Literary Worlds, which appeared in 2012 from Oxford University Press. And um, Eric is not just a prolific scholar, I'm now flipping over the dozens of pages of the talks and publications and other things that he's done here, but he's also a fantastic teacher who has developed a remarkable rapport with students. Uh, he teaches a number of courses that down the road you might actually find yourself in, including Asian poetry in the world picture, introduction to video game culture, which I'm, I'm sure many of you um, probably have your own views about, theories of the photographic, and then more traditional um, literature classes, for instance, one that he'll be teaching in the spring on Proust. So Eric is, uh, I think, probably one of our, our, our most distinguished professors at the college and is really the ideal person to introduce you to the concept of what it means to be successful in college and also how it is to do it uh, and what other things you need to do. Before I hand over to him, let me say that the 68th person to come into this room today got a free t-shirt which is available for pickup on your way out the door, and that is Susan Claspy. So just please pick up your t-shirt on, on your way out, and um, we should all be wearing these 1968 tie-dye shirts before too long. All right, so hi, everyone. Um, it would be better, you know, when you get introduced to things like, so thank you, Michael, for that very nice introduction. It would be really better if when you got introduced for things like this, uh, people would say, oh, he's a terrible teacher. Uh, people hate him. Because then if I did like an okay job, you all would be semi-impressed and feel like, oh, that was, you know, for a guy who was a terrible teacher, that was not that bad. But um, so apparently I'm a great teacher. So this is going to be amazing. And if it's just like this short of amazing, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, so we have that to look forward to. Um, I hope to send you home uh, disappointed tonight. Uh, so uh, my name is Eric, and I teach in the Comparative Literature Department. And uh, I wanted to give a talk that referred a little bit to the revolutionary theme of the year, or of the year that's coming, uh, and which takes its title from this piece of graffiti, Sous les pavés la plage, which was one of the pieces of graffiti that became most famous during the riots, the student and worker organized riots in May 1968 in France. And, and as you'll learn if you take the class in 1968, uh, there were a number of worldwide student movements, protest movements in China, in France, in the United States, and all over Europe, in Germany, Spain, uh, in the UK, in the United States, not just in 68, but in the years up through following 68 and 72, my own university, Georgetown, a student riot was dispersed uh, by military helicopters dropping tear gas. Um, so the things you see on TV these days in Charlottesville uh, and, and in various marches uh, for and against various political positions that, that, that we're all familiar with um, are things that students were engaged with very much in the 60s and which shaped, as Michael said, our culture today in ways that are really, really profound. And I think um, in many ways, we're still fighting the fights of the, of the late 60s for uh, questions of equality, uh, for questions of the future of the socialist or the democratic state, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that's, that's where we're starting today. This is the most famous iteration of the phrase, sous les pavés la plage. That is, this is the, the handwriting or the um, spray paint, spray can writing that, uh, version that is most famous. But this phrase actually appeared all over France, it was, it was come up with by a guy named Bernard Cousin, 
uh, who was a worker, who was a striking worker at one of the factories, and they were having a meeting about slogans they should put up around Paris. And one of the things he proposed was that the, they should you combine two things. They should combine uh, their desire to pick up cobblestones and throw them at the police, uh, which I don't recommend. Uh, uh, that, well, it, it is likely, in my experience, that those of you who are all in this room will at some point during your four years at Penn State have a chance to participate in a riot. Uh, uh, that riot will almost certainly be about football, uh, <laughs> as opposed to something like freedom, uh, sadly. But if you do participate in a riot, my advice to you is do not throw cobblestones at the police, uh, because it's wrong and you'll get in trouble. Right? But in France in 1968, uh, people who were trying to fight against the police uh, and were trying to resist the police uh, pulled up cobblestones from the streets. And under the cobblestones, what they found was uh, a layer of sand. And that layer of sand serves an engineering purpose, right? which is that it helps stabilize the cobblestones, helps increase drainage, and so on and so forth. And it creates a nice flat surface for the cobblestones to, to sit on. And so um, this was a, a kind of a moment which Cousin said, you know, look, first of all, we are tearing up the streets because we're against society. And what we find under, under the streets, which represent society to us, right, which represent engineering and so on and so forth, is we find the beach. And the beach is a, is a kind of utopian place. right? The beach is a place where uh, people can be free, wh which we associate with childhood, which we should associate with play and fun and so on and so forth. Right? So this, this moment of, 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 of cousins, which I, I love so much, is, is a moment about not only saying, OK, let's throw cobblestones at the cops, but it's actually a moment in which he, he sees that what you might think of as civil society, that is engineered society, right? Roads are necessary for commerce. They're necessary to bring people together. They're necessary to trade goods and so on and so forth. They're necessary to organize our lives. But underneath civil society is a layer of something that feels like a very different kind of society, a society that's oriented towards pleasure and happiness, that's oriented towards play and togetherness, right? That's oriented towards leisure and uh, and, and a lack of interest in instrumentalization, right? A lack of interest in the economy, a lack of interest in success. Uh, and, and, and so that, that combination of the cobblestones and the beach, right? There's two ways to read this saying. One of the ways to read this saying is, forget the cobblestones, life is all about the beach. That's not the way I'm interested in reading the saying. And, and again, I don't know what Cousin believed, but what I'm interested in, in having you see is that the entire layer of our society, our functional society, for which the cobblestones here are going to suffice as a kind of metaphor, right, rests on another layer that is the layer of human happiness and human pleasure. And the reason that we have a society at all is not because we need to make money, but because we have banded together as a society to orient ourselves towards our thriving, towards the thriving of individuals. And that thriving includes their pleasure. The first person to build a chair built a chair, why? Because it sucks to stand all the time. Why does it suck to stand all the time? Because it hurts your body. Right? The chair is an expression right, of care for a body that needs to sit. Right? This classroom is an expression of care for students who might want to learn. This university is an expression of care for a society that needs to educate people. Right? Our whole infrastructure is built around a series of expressions of care. Pillows and blankets exist because it's not as fun to sleep on the cold ground as it is to sleep on a cushy pillow with your Hello Kitty blanket, right? That, well, I have a Hello Kitty blanket. I don't know about you. You can have your own blankets. You can have a, uh, there's a, my favorite Hello Kitty thing is that there's a Chinese knockoff of Hello Kitty called Hi Peter uh, that I purchased. And, so you can have a Hi Peter blanket and I will stick with my authentic Hello Kitty blanket. In any case, uh, so I, what I want you to see is that, that, that our, our whole world is a combination of what you might think of as infrastructural, engineering-oriented, purpose-oriented uh, activity of the kind that you yourselves might think that you're engaged in today because you might have come to the university to get a job, right? A purposeful kind of thing, a cobblestone kind of thing. And what I want to suggest to you is that under that getting a job part of coming to the university is something else, which is everything that the beach stands for, which is your flourishing, your flourishing outside of the regime of instrumentality. But that is to say, outside of the regime of being forced to make money, but that involves you becoming a person who is able to enjoy and be in life as you want to be. Right? That this is partly, this educational process is partly about you coming to your own freedom so that you can participate freely in the building of society that cares for others. And that cares for others by, among other things, building roads. 
because roads help us get to each other, help us connect to each other, help us sell things to each other that we need and like and want, and so on and so forth, right? I'm just showing you a few slogans from 68. So that's the, what you might think of as that, that little opening is the kind of thematic, thematic opening of, of, the, of the talk. And what I want to do for the rest of the time is I want to talk to you about how to succeed in college. Now, what I mean by succeed, right, is something very particular, which is that I, I think I mean this. You are, all of you, in your first year, and you, are, you or your families, are, or the state of Pennsylvania, are about to spend $150,000-ish educating you over the next four years. Some of you more, some of you less, depends, right? But some, some group of people somewhere, some of it's you yourselves, you're taking out loans, you're gonna pay them back when you work. Some of it's your families, some of it's Penn State is basically giving you scholarships, which means that there are other students at Penn State who are paying full tuition, who are helping pay for your scholarships, right? So you're being supported by other people, some of you, right? Some of you are being supported by the state of Pennsylvania, those of you who are from in-state, right? And all of you, of course, are being supported by the United States, right, which, which, which puts $900 million a year of research money into Penn State and helps this university be. And of course, Penn State is not uniquely located or simply located in the United States, but we're all supported by all of the students and all of the faculty who come from other countries to help make this possible, right? There is a lot of human effort and human care going into your next four years. Some of it from people you know and who love you and who care about you, like your families, I hope, right? or hate you, but are giving you the money for college anyway, I guess. Uh, and some of it from total strangers. Some of it from people who are sitting next to you in this room, and some of it from people you'll never meet. Some of it from people who are dead, and who made this university happen 150, 200 years ago, and have made it possible for you to be here, right? Everyone in this room is the beneficiary. Everyone in this room is the beneficiary of an enormous amount of labor. And the question is, what does it mean for you to succeed relative to that level of care and labor? How are you going to live up to and honor the gift that's been given to you? So I want to make, I think, eight points, okay? Each point's very simple. The first point is, you are not here to graduate and do a job. This is college. If you're lucky, you're going to live another 40 or 50 years. In those 40 or 50 years, the world will change at least as much as it has changed since 1968. So think back to the world of 1968, right? When the entire political system of the entire planet was governed by the Cold War and the fight against communism or for communism, depending on which side you were on, right? And the Soviet Union existed, right? The internet didn't exist. Computers didn't exist, right? America was much whiter than it was. China was right on the verge, it just started in 1966, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, which was one of the great uh, political and, and sociological disasters of, of modern Chinese history, right? In which, in which millions of people died. They were coming out of, right out of the Great Leap Forward, in which at least 20 or 30 million people died of starvation, right? The world that people graduated into in 1968 was, was their world, and they came out of college prepared for that world. And over the course of their lifetimes, that world changed in ways that some people kind of imagined, but in ways that most people didn't imagine at all. People are generally pretty shitty at imagining what the future is going to look like. Go back and read sci-fi books from 30, 40 years ago. Go back and watch Star Trek. People have really mostly no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea what you're going to use your education for. If you spend the next four years learning how to do a job, that you're gonna start the day after you graduate and nothing else, you will be obsolete in five to 10 years. If you spend the next five years focusing only on learning about stuff that happened in the last nine months, right, only taking classes that focus on useful stuff, that things that seem like they're gonna be immediately gonna pay off for you, your education and your knowledge will be obsolete in five to 10 years. Your job here is to learn how to learn and change. You have to learn how to learn and change because you will need to grow. You have no idea what's going to happen. Imagine someone who majored in Russian in 1989, right? Graduating, coming out of college in Russian, no idea that the Soviet Union was about to collapse, no idea that their whole, the entire world in which Russian might or might not be useful was going to alter and change, right? 
if that person learned not just Russian, but learned how to learn languages, learned how to think about culture, learned how to interact with the world, maybe learned some other skills that might have, been, might have come in handy, that person would be able to adapt to the universe as it changed and grow over their lifetime. Your job is not to finish growing at age 22 and quit growing until you're 70, at which point you retire and do God knows what, garden, right? I don't know what people are retired to do. Right? Your job is to become someone who can grow today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Your job is to learn how to learn. So when you're choosing your classes, when you're choosing your majors and your minors, that's part of what you have to think about. Two, maximize your receptors. What do I mean by this? The world is full of stimuli. Okay, The world is full of stimuli. Imagine the difference between most of me or you right, walking into an art museum and looking at a bunch of art. Someone who knows a lot about art is receiving stimuli from that art, right? They're looking at that art and they're understanding it. Imagine someone who knows a lot, let, let, let's pick something that some of you probably know a little more about. Someone who knows a lot about hip hop. Let's say, let's say because, I'm gonna, because I'm giving the talk. Someone who knows a lot about the hip hop of the 1980s and early 90s, right? Someone who knows a lot about the hip hop can hear a public enemy song, right? And immediately know, just based on the rhythm, based on the quality of the language, right? Based on the way that rhyme is deployed, Right, based on the topics of the songs and the focus of the song, that that is an East Coast band, right? That Public Enemy, Chuck D, Flavor Flav are, an e are producing East Coast hip hop in a context of West Coast hip hop and East Coast hip hop and the whole fight, Tupac, yada yada, Big E, Smalls, the end, right? So, that, that, but that's a real thing. And if you don't know anything about hip hop and you listen to that song, it just sounds like every other piece of hip hop. But if you know something, all of a sudden you can receive the stimuli. Right? There's things happening in this music that you can understand and grow from. Just like if you look at a Picasso and you don't know anything about art, you see one thing, but someone who knows a lot about Picasso sees something else. If you speak Russian and you hear someone speak in Russian, you actually understand meaning. Whereas if you don't speak Russian, it just sounds like blah, blah, blah. Right? Knowledge produces receptors to stimuli. The world is full of stimuli. When you look at a bridge, what do you see? You might just see a bridge. What does an engineer see when an engineer looks at a bridge? When you look at the sun, what do you see? What does an astronomer or a physicist see when they look at the sun? Right? Knowing produces receptors to the world, to the universe. The more you know, the more receptors you have, the richer this life is. People who know lots of things are walking through an incredibly rich life, an incredibly rich universe of information, of ideas, of connections to other human beings. People who don't know things are walking through a deeply, deeply impoverished version of the world. Your job is to increase and maximize the number of receptors that you have to the, to the universe. Right? And those receptors can be in any field, any field, but they can also be interpersonal receptors. Right? They can be knowing how to talk to someone who's from another country, knowing how to talk to someone who's in a different race than you, right? Knowing how to talk to someone who's significantly older or younger than you, right? Those are receptors too, right? Some people don't like some, you know, I remember when I was, when I, before I had kids, I was kind of creeped out by kids. And so when I would be with a baby, like babies are actually, it turns out they're interesting, I think. But now that I have one, I see it. But before I had one, I didn't really get it. And so I had no way to interact with babies, but babies are producing stimulus and you can learn things from babies all the time, right? They're, they're quite interesting creatures, right? But if you don't know, you don't know, right? To quote, I believe, Biggie, right? right? So maximize your receptors. Maximize your receptors and build your educational program. Each of you is going to build for the next four years an educational program. You have people telling you, your advisor is going to tell you, your parents are going to tell you, oh, do this, it hasn't, and so on and so forth. Other friends will be like, oh, this class is amazing. Your job is to take charge of your own education and build a program that maximizes not only your receptors today and, and in the future for year four, but your ability to create new receptors. I sometimes tell my students, if you see one more beautiful thing in your life than you would have seen without my class, I win. That's one of the ways I think about my teaching. Is you come into my class, my job, one of my jobs is to make you appreciate and see beauty in, th in things that you didn't think were beautiful. And if I get you to do that, my education, when I teach you, I'm not teaching you for tomorrow. I'm teaching you for your whole life. I don't, my arc is if, if when you're 40 or 50 or 60, you think one time about me, I win. I've taught you something. Right? I mean, unless you think like I hated that guy, which is possible, of course. But then, but then I, I, I think I kind of win anyway. 
Hatred is just a kind of love. Um, okay, this is very practical advice. If you can study abroad, and if you're already planning to study abroad, study abroad twice. This is, again, you will never, ever, ever have as easy an opportunity to study abroad as you do when you're in college. Right? The college has lots of money to help support this. The whole commitment of Penn State is that studying abroad should cost you the same amount as being here. Right? Knowing that, planning that, my advice to you is to study abroad as early as possible. I know that studying abroad is scary. I understand. In another country, you don't know, speak the language, it seems weird, and you miss your friends. I get it. I get all of it. Right? But one of the best things you can do for yourself is to go somewhere else and understand for the first time not just what other people are like. The point of studying abroad is not to go out to other places and be like, oh my god, these other people are so weird. Right? The point is that when you come back from studying abroad, what you see for the first time is how weird you are. Right? And so studying abroad is partly at least about self-knowledge. It's also about maximizing your receptors. It's about doing these other things I've been talking about. Right? But studying abroad is about challenging yourself to see the ways in, what you, in, in which who you are is a product of your culture and not simply a set of choices that you individually have made. Right? When I went um, and I studied in China the first time, uh, I, I got used to eating uh, soup the Chinese way, which is with a bowl and a spoon up here, right? Just kind of scooping. And, uh, and so I came back. This is not a good example of what you learned from studying abroad, but I just got used to it. So it was fine. So I came back, and I remember I was eating dinner with my folks uh, on the first night I was back, and we were having soup. And so I just started doing this. And at some point, I was kind of talking and eating. And at some point, I looked up, and both of them were staring at me. My folks are kind of proper people. I was staring at me totally horrified, totally horrified at like my horrible breach of manners. And I kind of looked up, and it was like, like a dog looks up when it's been caught, like eating something it shouldn't. Right? <laughs> and, I, and I kind of had this moment where I was like, oh, like this is. But what I was able to see in that moment, of course, is I was able to see my own culture. I was able to see the ways in which both I changed, but also the ways in which I'd been trained to eat a certain way, to operate a certain way. It's little things like that that make studying abroad worthwhile. So even if I know some of you are already probably planning to go, whatever, go somewhere else. Go to the place you're planning to go and go somewhere else. Be brave. Be brave, be tough, right? Be tough enough to, to go wherever it is and just pick a place and go. You don't have to speak the language, go. I guarantee you it will be a transformational experience for you. And those of you who are from other countries and were thinking, oh, I don't need to study abroad, I'm already abroad. No, this is also a wonderful opportunity for you to go even somewhere else and maximize your receptors by going to another place. Right? Study abroad, super important. And, you know, and also, whatever the practical blah, 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 knowing the world, you'll get a better job, yada, yada, yada. Right? I don't care about that that much because I, I think in the long run it's going to work out. Um, follow teachers, not subjects. So one of the things about teaching that you all know is that some people like some teachers and some people don't. Right? You all have teachers that you like and you all have teachers you don't like from high school. Right? And not everybody likes the same teachers. And that's okay because teachers are just people. Right? And they're humans like you and me, right? And, you know, I don't like everybody. I don't like all my students. I try to teach all my students, but I don't like them all. Because, you know, I don't like everybody. Right? I'm not that nice. Right? Most, you don't like everybody. None of you likes everybody. Right? Everybody's got somebody who's like, I just don't like that guy. What's wrong? I just don't like his face. What's wrong with his face? Fine. I'm like, I don't like it. Why? I can't do anything about it. I just don't like it. Right? That happens. It doesn't have to be, they don't have to have good reason. You just don't like somebody. You will find teachers you like and teachers you don't like. Follow the teachers you like because as you all know, if you think back to your relationships to teachers you like, you learn more. Every time you had a teacher you like, you learn more. And the reason is because you wanted their respect and so you fought for their respect. Right? You fought for them to respect you because you liked them and you respected them and you wanted them to respect you. And because you wanted them to respect you, you worked harder for them. And when you had a teacher who you didn't care about and you didn't respect, you did the minimum that you had to do to get the grade that you thought you wanted, and that was it. Right? So if you come to Penn State and you only take classes from teachers who you don't like, you will learn on net much less than if you continually take classes from teachers you like. Right? Simple. And again, Part of this goes back to the thing I was saying earlier, which is you are now, for the first time in your life, in charge of your own education. That's the difference in college and high school. Right? In high school, you have to do what everybody tells you to do. You maybe get, you get one elective and you take drawing or whatever. Right? Like, that's, that's high school. Your parents are making decisions for you. The school's making decisions for you. You are now in a really complicated time because you are, you are invited at this moment to transition from being children to being adults. Right? 
And what does it mean to be an adult? An adult is responsible for him or herself. Right? Which means an adult is responsible for his or her own education. Right? So in high school, you just take whatever's next, right? It's fourth grade, I'm in fourth grade, fifth grade, I'm in fourth grade. What are you doing in fifth grade? Fifth grade math. What are you doing in sixth grade? Sixth grade reading. Right? That's how it works. Here, it's not like that. Each of you can have a radically different experience. This is an enormous university. You can study anything. You can study things you don't even know you can study. Right? Most of you hadn't imagined there could be a course called Introduction to Video Game Culture, but it's not that. You can study poultry science. You can study how to make grass grow. Right? You can study the history of 1968. Right? You can study um, what? You can study Chinese poetry. You can study uh, how to build certain kinds of bridges. You can study um, how uh, reproductive systems in insects work. Right? Like th the range of stuff you can study is enormous. And within that range, you have to make choices. And you need to make those choices proactively, not just by stumbling forward and doing the next thing. Right? And again, just imagine at the end of four years, if someone says to you, how'd you do? Like, oh, I just took whatever the advisor said. I just did the next thing. And someone else says, I really thought about it. And I worked hard and made plans. And when those plans didn't work out or didn't turn out the way, I changed my plans. And I built my education for myself so I could take advantage of this incredible opportunity that I had to be here and to be in college and learning. Right? I took advantage. And the other guy says, well, I just did whatever. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be in four years? OK, what's hedonic adaptation? Hedonic adaptation, hedonic means happiness. Adaptation is adapting to stuff. Uh, hedonic ad adaptation is a term sociologists use to describe the feeling you have when you really, really want something, and then you get it, and it stops making you happy. Right? Any of you have been a child, there's some toy you're super into, whatever. You want the Lego Millennium Falcon. You're talking about Lego Millennium Falcon for like months. You get the Lego Millennium Falcon. You're super into it. You finish building it. Now it sits uh, upstairs, uh, kind of outside your room, uh, and it's kind of half broken, and you do nothing with it. I'm describing, obviously, my own child. Um, but this is a common experience, right? It's the same, and we do the same with people, right? You start a relationship, you're super into the person. After a while, like, eh, I don't know, right? That happens. Hedonic adaptation, OK? Hedonic adaptation is the enemy, because hedonic adaptation makes this audience in particular Right? This audience in particular take for granted one of the most incredible things about itself, which is that you all, everyone in this room, is among the luckiest humans to ever have lived. Right? There have been probably, I don't know, 20 billion humans who've lived, let's say. I don't know if Michael, if you know the better number, but I figure there's, there's, there's nine today, and then there's probably nine, you know, so 20 billion humans, right? You are in the 0.1% of luckiest humans. No one in this room, hopefully, and again, if Trump starts a nuclear war with Korea, we'll see, but. No one in this room is going to die of diarrhea, right? Fingers crossed, kids, right? right? No one in this room is going to die of an easily curable disease, right? Most of you have a life expectancy into the 70s. Most of you will have surgeries for whatever medical problems. Most of you are, not, you know, if you go back and read about the 30s, I would tell you, just think about this. 200 years ago in France, the average life expectancy for a French peasant was 36. 36. Before the invention of anesthesia, surgical rooms in hospitals, where they also did dentistry, were often located in either the basement or a tower because the screams from the people having surgery were so loud that they disturbed other patients. Right? Usually the way that surgery worked was people, there were four men who held people down. Right? They just held, pe held the surgical patient down to keep the surgical patient from wriggling and screaming too much while they did the surgery. Okay? None of you will ever have to go in through anything like that. Unless you cheat on one of my tests. Um, uh, so you are, you're all clothed. You're warm. Right? Unless you make kind of dumb choices and then uh, clothing-wise and are walking home too late from a party, you will mostly be warm this year. Right? You, you will mostly be well-fed. Right? You, you, you are so incredibly lucky. And I'm going to tell you right now, you didn't earn it. None of you deserves it, right? There are, of, of, of those 20 billion people, right? And I'll mention, my son Jules was born with an intellectual disability that probably means that he'll never be able to sit in a room like this, right? He didn't deserve that, he didn't earn that. That's just his deal, right? None of you earned what you got, which is to be incredibly, incredibly lucky, to be smart enough to be here, to be genetically gifted enough, to not have had any serious accidents, to have 
somehow cobble together the money to be here, to be living in a society that provides you with antibiotics and medical care, to be warm, right? To not have been born in all of the other places in this world that are much, much worse than the place that you were born in, right? You have to earn that. You have to earn that, right? How do you earn it? You earn it by honoring it and by working, by being grateful to the universe, or you can be grateful to God or Allah if you'd like to be grateful to God or Allah, but you have to be grateful to somebody. And if it's just grateful to the universe, you have to earn it. Because if you squander it, if you squander this gift, right, if you squander this gift by fucking around, by drinking your way through college, whatever it is that you do, right, if you squander this gift, what you are saying is a giant fuck you to everybody else who is not as lucky as you, right? You're saying to my son Jules, you're saying, like, fuck you, dude. I got it. I was born with it. I'm just going to waste it. Right? You have a, an incredible gift. Do not squander this gift. Do not squander this gift. And it's on you. Now, it's on you, and it's on all the other people who are going to help you. Okay? Evaluate yourself. What does that mean? How are you doing? This is part of growing up and becoming an adult. Right? This is part of growing up and becoming an adult. Until now, your goals were mostly set by other people. This is what we want you to do. We want you to get college, we want you to do this, we want you to get these grades, we want you to do this sport, we want you to take this class, right? This is the moment as you transition into adulthood when you begin to set your own goals. Right? When you begin to set your own goals. How many of you have sat down seriously and thought, what do I want to accomplish this year? What are my goals this year? Not just academically, but what are my goals as a, as a, as a friend? Am I going to be a better friend this year? Am I going to end the year being about as good a friend as I was before? Am I as good a friend as I want to be? Am I proud of how I'm a friend? Am I proud of how I'm a son or a brother or a sister or a daughter? Right? Am I doing a good job with, what, with whatever it is? Am I doing a good job in school if that's what I've decided? One of the things I did in college that was really uh, meaningful to me and I probably spent much more time on it than I did on, on my classes in my first few years was that I worked at the school newspaper and I, I you know, was the editor at one point in the school newspaper. And that was really transformative. It was a great experience for me. So I'm not saying like you have to get straight A's. I'm saying you have to decide what your goals are, what's meaningful to you. And then you have to think about whether you're accomplishing that. You have to be honest with yourself about what you're doing and how it's going. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to give you a little tip. This is also a very tip. This is a helpful tip for how to get along with your professors. I give this all, all large classes. This guy already here in the red sweatshirt's got it, but, uh, but the rest of you need to learn a little bit. This is, um, uh, you know, when, when you're teaching class, one of the things you're looking at is you're looking at students, you're looking at faces, you're trying to see reactions, right? One of the best things you can do, and it'll make your professor happy, and they'll like you, and it'll also help another human out, which is kind, is that when someone looks at you, you just give a nod. Or even when they're not looking, you just a little nod like this. This man, he said, yeah, I just gave it right again. So, yeah, so when I'm talking, like I'm talking out in here, I'm looking at your face, and like, in a case, some of you are like nodding, like, right? So that guy right there, is, and I'm, I'm, I love him. I'm, I want to be his best friend already. Like, if you're in my class, I just give you an A. It doesn't matter. Take whatever I'm teaching. Because uh, I'm so grateful to him because I'm nervous, right? Every, all the teachers, the teachers are just people. Just so you know, teachers are just people. They're just people, and they're mostly scared, just like you, right? They're scared, and they want to be good, and they want to be liked, and they want to do a good job teaching. They want, to, they want to teach you things. They want you to learn things, and so on and so forth, right? And so if you can just give them back a little bit. Now I'm going to teach you, so you, the rest of you need to work on your basic nod, okay? Just your basic nod. Like, I look at you and, like, just give me, yeah, see, there you go. Yeah, that's right. That's how it works, right? Give me a nod. And then this is now, this, I'm going to teach uh, this gentleman here. He's going to learn the advanced nod, and you can watch, and then you'll know when you master the basic nod, you can, you can level up uh, uh, to get the advanced nod. Now, so the advanced nod is this. It's, 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 uh, it helps it to be in a smaller class. But the way that works is I look at you, and you give me a nod that makes me a little nervous, but then you're like, it's, oh, I'll just do it here. I'll, I'll do it and I'll describe it. It's like, oh, yeah, now I get it. See that? See this? So there's a little pause like, yeah, OK, now I'm with you. See that? So that's so good because I, I kind of think like, oh, he was really thinking. And then it wasn't just like a pro forma level one nod. He was like really thinking about it. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, right. See that? So there's just that lift up and then pause and then you nod. OK, so that's just pro tip for you. I guarantee you I've just elevated your GPAs. It's really going to be, but also it's a way to be kind to your faculty because we, uh, we need feedback and evaluation. So, so keep, keep it up, my man. You're doing a really good job. Now, uh, lesson number seven, uh, learn to suffer a little bit for things that matter. So one of the things that's very weird about American culture, it's not necessarily true in other cultures, but very weird about American culture, is that we all agree, everyone in this room who's American, agrees that it is acceptable for an adult to make you throw up in the pursuit of athletic improvement. Everyone agrees. You're in two a days. The coach is yelling at you. You fall down on the run. Goes like, get up, Megan, run, run, like that, right? 
That's acceptable. An adult is allowed to yell at you and to, and, and to cause you physical pain in the pursuit of athletic improvement. Right? We all get it. You watch any movie you want about athletic things, it's all about that. It's about learning to suffer and how you achieve greatness through suffering. Right? You would, you, and you, the only achievement comes through suffering. And those of you who are athletes know that's true. Right? That, that you I mean, rest is important, but you have to push yourself to the limit to cause the breakdowns in muscle tissue, to push yourself past the moment when you want to quit. Right? I remember so vividly, even this, this was actually true the other day, a, a thing in high school, I was running steps, and then if I fall down these steps right now and break my leg, I won't have to run steps anymore. It would have been so good. I couldn't bring myself to just throw myself down steps. But that kind of suffering where you, where you have to push yourself past the moment when you're really hurting, right? We all get that. I have had, in my career, I've been teaching for 20 years, more than 20 years now, I've had so many students come up to me and say, your class is too hard. Student, I've had students like in ROTC, in the military, police officers, like all these tough guys. I mean, your class is too hard. You're asking us to do too much. And what I want to say is, come on, maggot. Right? These are people who probably on the weekends are like crawling under barbed wire while fake bullets shoot at them and other nonsense, right? We don't have a culture in which we understand that to learn involves being uncomfortable and pushing yourself, right? I am not here to tell you. Imagine if I said, don't worry about college. You'll, you're not going to be pushed at all. You're just going to have to, you, you already know exactly what you need. It'll just be more of the same shit for four years, and you're fine, right? Part of this is your faculty's choice. Part of it is your choice. Are you going to suffer to grow, right? I keep telling you you need to grow. How do you grow? You grow by pushing yourself. You grow by being brave. Right? You grow by challenging yourself. And the good news is that there are thousands and thousands of people at this university who are here to help you when you go through those experiences. Right? There, are, there are the faculty, not just the faculty, the administrative staff, there are the advisors, there are the counseling staff. We all understand. We all understand because it was hard for us to. None of us got to be, Michael didn't get to be head of history department by taking it easy. I didn't get to write my books and do the work that I've done by taking it easy. I got, to, I got to do this work and I built this career because I fought and I pushed and I pushed myself and I demanded more of myself over and over, right? Even on days when I wanted to quit, right? So that's what we're asking you to do. And I'm asking you to do it, I'm asking you to do it in order to honor your privilege and in order to earn your privilege. Right, in order to earn your luck. But I'm also asking you to do it because my job is to try to convince you to make this an amazing experience for yourself. Right? Teaching is the only thing where someone will come into my class and you know, I, have a, I teach a big class, like 300 people, so I can't take attendance. So people just come and go and it's fine. Um, and, uh, and you know, people will come to class and then they'll get nothing out of it, but they'll get like a C because they like somehow read a few PowerPoints like the day before the exam things. And they'll feel happy. They'll be like, ha ha. Like, I fooled Hayo. I got, like, I did nothing, or I did almost nothing, and I got a C. Like, imagine if you went to McDonald's and, like, paid them for your Happy Meal, and then they gave you, like, two fries. You're like, ha ha, I fooled McDonald's. I gave them the full value of my thing, but then they only gave me a tiny bit. But I've, like, so I've tricked McDonald's. That's a crazy way to think. I, first of all, it doesn't cost me anything, right? McDonald's probably have to take your money for no fries. If you want to go in and give McDonald's $5, they'll take it. You come to my class and learn nothing, like, I, like it's okay, I can't, I can't, I've got 300 students, like, I can't, it's not on me to catch you, right? You've got to catch you. That's your job. But also, you're paying me to do this for you. Like, I'm not doing this for my health. Right? I'm trying to give you something. If you don't want to take it, at least don't be proud that you didn't take it. If you don't like it, don't be in, I mean, that's the other thing is, is again, be a grown-up. Like, don't take the class. That's okay. Like, if, if you don't want to be in my class, don't take the class. Like, if you don't want to be in class, don't take the class. Go do something else. That's totally fine. But if you're going to be there, this is like, this is a buffet of knowledge of, and, 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 it's, and you, should, you should be trying to, like, you should be at the, like, at the Chinese buffet, right? You know, the Chinese buffet, you're not going just for, like, the one thing. You're not just eating the pudding. Right? You want one of everything. You want like one crab rangoon and one sweet and sour stick and whatever. God knows. Right? You, this is a buffet of knowledge and of opportunities for you. Not just in class, but out of class. You need to grab all that stuff and stuff it in your mouth. Right? And work hard to get as much of that into you as you can. Okay. Tell your own story. Last thing. Okay? What does tell your own story mean? It means this. Again, this is part of growing up. Right? 
This, what I want to say to you, what I want to urge you to think about and do is to try to become the people you want to be on your deathbed. Right? At some point, you're going to die. And again, as far as we know, we only get the one life. Right? Even if we get, like, even if you're reincarnated, you don't know about it. So as far as we know, it's, again, as far as you're concerned, one life. Right? One life. What are people going to say about you? He spent the last 30 years of his life using all of his leisure time to watch Sports Center in the basement. You know, I guarantee you there's someone in this room whose dad is, is that person. Right? He spent as little time with his children as possible. He never really worked hard at his job because he didn't care that much. He was a guy who would only go a little bit out of his way to help another person. He was a guy who never became as good as he could have been. Right? Those are all things that people can say, and I bet they can say them about people you know. She was a person who never really fixed her relationship with her mother because it was too hard to talk through things and work it out. So they never really spoke after, you know, after their mother hit 65. He was a guy who never went to a museum. He was someone who was afraid to talk to people who had a different skin color than him, who spoke a different language. When the neighbors from India moved in next door, he never talked to them at all. Right? When his company had a chance to send someone abroad, he was too afraid to go, so someone else went and took their families abroad for a year. And he stayed home. Right? He squandered his gift. He didn't try hard enough because he was afraid to suffer. He wasn't, he wasn't brave. Right? Those are things people say about people. And they're true things. And everyone in this room knows somebody about whom one of those things is probably true. Right? So the question is, how are you going to build your life? You're free now. You're out of, you're out of the house. You know, for those of you whose parents are paying for your tuition, obviously there's still some control there and you have to go back and so on. Right? There's still some laundry to be done. Right? But you're, you're becoming free. You're becoming free. You're not free today, but you're becoming free. Right? You're becoming free, and you're going to become more and more free. What are you going to do with that freedom? What are you going to do with those choices? That's the question that I want you to think about when you walk away today. Right? How are you going to take responsibility for this one life that you have? How are you going to make the choices that other people are going to respect and honor? How are you going to be proud of yourself? How are you going to make other people who know you proud to know you? Because you've set an example for them about what it looks like to earn your privilege, to work hard, to suffer, to grow, and to open yourself to the world in the ways that are made possible for you by an education here at Penn State. All right? I'll stop right there. I am happy to take questions. We have however many minutes you need. And it's okay if you don't have to. It's worth asking some questions about how to find the beach underneath the cobblestone. Mm -hmm. It really is like, magnificent. Oh, well, you know, it's fine. I mean, it's, and it's also fine not to have questions. It really is. This is also, I just want to say this is the last image because I like it so much. It's, uh, it says, under the concrete, the cobblestones. And it's from 2005, stamped on a Parisian sidewalk. Um, and, and one of the things this is about, is, is this image, is, is about the way that the beach gets further and further away when you forget that it's there, right? But it's also about the way that, that culture is always made up of layers. Um, and those layers also tell a story about who we are and how we got to be here, right? And that's a story that, that, that history classes will, will teach you. Um, in any case, any questions for me about anything? You can really, I, seriously, you can ask me anything you want. Yes? What classes do you teach? So I teach this video games class that I'm teaching right now that's, got, got, um, that's a big class, like three or 400 people. And I'm teaching next semester a class called Modern Novel. That is a class that's on um, Marcel Proust and James Joyce, uh, two of the greatest novels, as far as I'm concerned, of all time, and kind of amazing. So that's what I teach. Anyone else? Yep. What made me interested in teaching? I had the right teacher. I mean, I thought I wanted to be a journalist for a long time. And then I thought I wanted to be a creative writer. And then I took a class from a guy named Henry Schwartz. Uh, who was a professor of mine at Georgetown. Henry Schwartz was actually from Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour from here. Um, and Henry uh, 
when he was in college and then when he was in grad school, he went to Duke for grad school, he learned Bengali. And I remember thinking, I was so impressed. I mean, first of all, he was super cool. He was like, you know, 29 years old. He was my professor. Like, we played pool together. Like, so he was like the coolest teacher that you could ever imagine, right? But also, Henry had done this thing, which is that he'd gone and learned Bengali. And even though, like, no one in his family was Bengali, he was just like some Jewish kid from Jersey Shore. And, um, and I just remember thinking, like, wow, like, every person from the West should learn a non-Western language. And so that's what started me on studying Chinese. Uh, and so then I studied Chinese and I did my PhD. And so, I mean, then one thing led to another. But I think that I, I, I didn't know that I loved teaching. I, I knew that I liked giving people advice and talking a lot. So uh, those things came in handy. But I, 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 it turns out that teaching is, is one of the great thrills. Uh, when it goes well, uh, it's amazing. I mean, when it goes badly, um, like the worst thing, Michael will know this, is the worst thing is to teach a bad class on a, on a Thursday when you're teaching a Tuesday, Thursday class. Because then basically you have to wait four days until you can teach again. And so you're just like, you're kicking yourself all weekend uh, about it. So, uh, and even then, like this Tuesday, I taught a really good class yesterday. And I thought, oh man, now I have to teach again. Like I, can't, I can only enjoy the glow for like, th you know, 36 hours. Uh, so, but teaching is amazing, teaching is great. So that's, but I had the right teacher. And I think that's, you know, that's for a lot of stuff. Um, you just have the right teacher. And, and I don't, you know, my goal is not to turn you all into college professors I'm not interested in. And that my goal is, is, as a teacher, is to make you uh, as powerful as you can be. You know, I, I, want, I want you to, to have power in the world, to change the world and to change yourself in relation to the world. And that's what all this is about, is about why, you know, how do you get these receptors and what do you do with them? It's about empowering you to make the change that you want to see, right? Because it, it turns out, I mean, you know, one of the weird things about 68 is it turns out that, you know, throwing cobblestones at the police doesn't actually work. It's not, it's not effective. But there are other things that have happened. The world is a lot better in many respects than it was in 68. And, 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 and that's because people understood, you know, people who worked hard and fought and, and understood the world did stuff and were great in all, all kinds of moments. And so, you know, that's part of what I'm interested in as a teacher. Anyway, last question for anyone. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty smart, and that allowed me to get away with a lot of stuff. So for example, I, I was known at Georgetown. Like people who didn't know me knew me as the guy who sleeps in class. Um, and so I took a lot, especially my first two years, when I kind of wasn't too serious about school. I basically used my intelligence to kind of get away with not doing anything until right before exam week. So I, I think for my Western Civ uh, class, I point at Michael because it was in the history department in Georgetown, I basically didn't go and then the day before the exam I read the textbook um, and I got an A. And so I, I, and, and, and I, I, I had this experience, one of my classes actually, where I basically didn't like the class, didn't like the teacher, thought he was a jerk, his name was John Glavin. Uh, I still you always remember it. Uh, but he turned out to be great. But I, I actually didn't like the class at all. And then I studied for the final. And I was studying for the final. I was studying for the final. I was reading all the stuff for the class for the first time. And it was an amazing experience. I was like, oh my god, this was an incredible class. This was all this stuff. And I missed it all. And, I, and, and so then I took, you know, so what happened then was that at some point in my junior year, I took this class with Henry. And, and I, I, I also stopped working at the newspaper, which was, you know, I was working in the newspaper like 40 hours a week. And um, it was so I, I decided to get, my second semester of my junior year, I, I decided to get eight hours of sleep a night, which is also transformative. I recommend it. Um, and I went to all my classes, and I did all the reading, and I was learning all this stuff. And it was this incredible experience for me. And I remember calling my parents one night at 2 in the morning. This was before cell phones, so I just I like called their house phone and woke them up. And I just called them, and I said, I just want to say thank you for sending me to college. This is so great. I'm having such an amazing time. And it was the first moment when I really got it. So when I give you all this advice, it's not because I followed all this advice. I was not a very good student in high school either. It's because I actually didn't follow most of this advice and I learned the hard way. And so I think it's fine. One of the things that I think it's fine to learn the hard way and that's okay. Uh, but that, that would be, I mean, I don't, know if I, you know, I don't know if I would go back and say like, I like who I am now. So it's always hard to repudiate. Like I've done all sorts of things that, I, that are terrible and that I'm ashamed of. Uh, uh, but I'm pretty happy right now. So. I feel like I wouldn't want to go back and mess with one of them in case that turned out to be like, you know, I don't know, like then the Patriots would have won the Super Bowl like every year. 
So you'd be like, you know, yes, you did this one thing, but now you've screwed up everything else, and it's a real disaster. So I, you know, so I don't know, but but I mean, that would be the one thing is I I really squandered um, my first two years of college, um, and so that would be sort of educationally, and then I would also tell myself that like my relationship with my high school girlfriend was doomed to fail, and to not be too depressed and upset when that happened. Uh, Oh, it's, it's okay, I'm happily married, it's all right, look, see? I, I got a ring on it, it's all right. Um, I mean, second time, so whatever, but still, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, it's good, All's real. I'm really happy. So I wish you lots of happiness and success at Penn State. Thank you very much for coming tonight. All right, you're welcome. Don't get so drunk you light yourself on fire. <laughs> Yeah. I think that would be my piece of advice. Yes, that would be, well, you know.